Okay, so I'll be talking about uh, the round complexity of secure quantum computation. This is joint work with Andrea, Dakshita, and Fermi. So it turns out that um, quantum information is pretty useful for cryptography. And uh, probably the most famous example of this is information theoretic key exchange, um, but there are uh, many other examples, including quantum money, so um, unclonable currency, um, other types of um, unclonable cryptography, so like encryption or signature schemes with unclonable keys, for example, um, provable deletion of information, um, copy protection of programs, and the list uh, goes on, and I'm probably missing many citations, but the point is that uh, quantum information uh, can be used to perform like various tasks that are um, uh, completely um, impossible uh, um, with only classical information, okay? So, you know, one could imagine a world in which uh, quantum information is being leveraged to perform all of these uh, um, interesting tasks. Um, uh, now, the, you know, one prominent goal of, of classical crypto uh, has been, you know, one goal has been to distribute trust among multiple parties, right, in order to avoid like single points of failure or corruption, things like this. So a pretty natural question to ask is whether these cryptographic tasks that make inherent use of quantum information uh, can be securely distributed among multiple parties, okay? Um, as a concrete example, maybe you have a quantum money scheme um, and where, of course, the, the, uh, the banknote generation procedure is, of course, quantum, but now you might want to distribute this generation procedure so there isn't a single entity that is just able to um, generate banknotes, right? But, okay, so this is just uh, one, one way uh, to motivate a more general um, uh, task that is uh, uh, the focus of this work, which is secure multi-party quantum computation, okay? So uh, what is this? It's, uh, um, you know, same as the classical, you know, well-studied classical MPC, except that we're going to allow um, parties to have quantum computers and uh, quantum inputs. And their goal is now to compute some quantum functionality over their quantum inputs um, to produce some, some quantum output, in, in, you know, in, um, in its most general form, right? And, and here actually we could consider like these inputs and outputs also being, being entangled. Um, so, you know, to do this, of course, they'll communicate with each other um, now over quantum channels, right? And security is, is the same as, as classically. We're going to say that um, if an adversary is corrupting some set of parties, say, say two and three, um, they shouldn't learn anything about the honest party inputs, um, except for what is already implied by their output, okay? And so, of course, like classical MPC is extremely well studied and is, uh, you know, dates all the way back almost to the beginning of modern crypto. Um, Multi-party quantum computation has also been studied, but of course, uh, not as much. Um, so what is known is that, you know, there are these two works in the early 2000s that, that constructed um, information theoretically secure um, protocols um, in the honest majority setting. Okay. Um, later on, the dishonest majority setting was considered. Um, and these works, uh, DNS, DGJMS, um, they present basically compilers showing that if you have secure classical computation, uh, you can con construct secure quantum computation, um, even you know, against uh, malicious adversaries corrupting an arbitrary um, um, subset of the parties. Okay, and so this is, you know, these these works really are works establishing the feasibility of, of secure multi-party quantum computation, right? And so this is kind of the state of affairs um, prior to our work. So, uh, you know, one, you know, potential issue or drawback with these protocols uh, really is uh, they're extremely uh, interactive, highly interactive protocols, right? So um, in particular, like the number of rounds uh, of communication required, and keep in mind this communication is in general gonna be quantum communication. So these parties, you know, sending quantum states to each other, right? In general, uh, in these protocols, it grows with the depth of the quantum circuit, okay? And so, you know, uh, round complexity is a, a notion that's uh, been heavily studied in the classical setting. Um, uh, and our work, the starting point of our work, our focus is on um, uh, round efficient secure quantum computation, okay? 
So we know these, these feasibility results exist. Okay, so now we want to study, um, uh, you know, whether, whether we can really obtain round efficiency in, in the quantum setting, right? And to be clear about the a particular setting that we are interested in is this dishonest majority um, setting uh, where adversary can corrupt an arbitrary subset of parties and can act arbitrarily and maliciously during the protocol. Okay. And we're also going to assume some minimal trusted setup. So, so a pretty common model of assuming like a common random string um, that, that the parties have access to. Okay. Um, right. So this is the focus of this work. Um, we have various results, both in the two party and the more than two party or multi-party setting. Um, and I'll kind of uh, split this talk into, into those two parts. Um, I'll be able to like give all our result statements along with some, uh, a little bit about like the techniques we use uh, to get them, um, but we'll, we'll leave a lot of the details to the paper. Okay. Um, so to, to begin with the two party case, we'll first look at, um, what's known about classical two-party computation, okay? So uh, these results, uh, you know, date back, to, date back to Yao in the 80s, um, who show that if you assume a two-message oblivious transfer protocol, and a, oblivious transfer is a, a extremely simple two-party functionality, right? Where we have a receiver with a bit B, sender with two strings, and the receiver at the end of the protocol learns one of the two sender strings, right? So it's very simple. Uh, oblivious transfer functionality that if you can do this in just two messages, then um, kind of amazingly, you can compute any uh, arbitrary classical functionality over um, it, over two, you know, two private inputs, xA and xB, um, delivering output to A, right? So um, basically OT, the simple functionality implies the ability to do secure computation of arbitrary uh, functionalities and even in a round preserving way. Okay, and so sometimes this is called um, NISC, uh, this protocol, a non-interactive secure computation protocol, and kind of the malicious version, like uh, NISC with malicious security was uh, formalized by this work in uh, IPS, okay? So um, our first result is just going to be a quantum analog of this, right? We're gonna show that uh, how to construct a quantum NISC protocol. Um, in other words, um, assuming just the same assumption. So, well, of course now post-quantum. So assuming post-quantum two message oblivious transfer, uh, you know, we can construct a two message protocol for computing any functionality, any quantum functionality that delivers output uh, to one party. Okay, so uh, quantum misc. Um, and I can say uh, a few words about uh, how we construct this protocol. Um, and to do that, we'll need a little bit of background on uh, classical garbled circuits. Right, so a classical garbled circuit is basically consists of uh, two procedures, garble and eval. And garble takes as input a uh, circuit or a functionality f and an input x and produces a garbled circuit f tilde and a garbled input x tilde. Um, okay, and the evaluation uh, functionality takes this garbled information and produces from it uh, the output f of x. Okay, and Security intuitively states that like this garbled information kind of only contains information about f of x, and this is formalized by saying there's a simulator that just just given f of x but not x, right, uh, can can produce something that is indistinguishable from this garbled information. Okay, um, and this is you know, it's it's only non-trivial when garble has some is simpler or lower complexity in some sense than f. Otherwise, garble could just evaluate f already, right? But when, when garble is um, sufficiently simple or efficient, then this, uh, this object has many applications. Right, so this is a classical garbled circuit. Uh, you could ask for the same thing in the quantum setting, right? And there's, there's, many, there's probably many ways to uh, formalize or like uh, kind of specify what sort of properties you'd want out of a quantum garbled circuit. And I will discuss one particular um, uh, set of properties. So, you know, here, like, so let's say you have, say, a classical description of a unitary U, but in general, maybe a more general quantum operation as well. And you have a, a, um, um, a quantum input X, right? So what we want out of our garble procedure is going to be, um, well, uh, the procedure that 
garbles u and produces u tilde, what we're going to require is going to be completely classical. Okay, so um, you know, takes a classical description of u and outputs a classical description of u tilde. Uh, and moreover, the the procedure that takes the input x um, and produces a garbled input x should be simple in some sense, which I'll be um, more specific about later. But this particular um, set of properties out of a garbled circuit, like um, was considered uh, in this recent work of Rikersky and Yuan. Uh, and they, they sketched how you might construct this and, and then we go and formalize and prove security of it in our work. Um, and to be uh, clear about what I meant by simple, basically the garbling, the input garbling procedure just basically takes your input X, appends some zero states and some so-called like magic T states. Um, and then re-randomizes everything with a random Clifford. And this is simple because like basically this Clifford computation is um, in general um, simpler than arbitrary an arbitrary quantum operation. Okay. Right. So, so we're going to uh, take this object as our starting point, a quantum garbling procedure um, down here with, uh, with a classical unitary or classical circuit garbling uh, subroutine, right? And we're going to use it to um, to build the NISC. Okay, so recall we have a um, you know two quantum parties, each with their quantum input, and we want uh, to uh, we want A to recover the, its output YA at the end of the interaction. Okay, so so first we're going to have A send over an encrypted version of its quantum input. For this, we'll use something called an Clifford encoding, and then we'll just basically have B send back a a garbled input. Okay, so it, it's going to append like its input xb to a's input xa, and it's going to garble that input by appending zero and two states, re-randomizing with the Clifford, right? So this gives a the garbled input. We also have to give a the garbled unitary, right? And so we're going to enable this with a classical TPC or a classical NISC protocol, okay? Um, and this is possible because this procedure that garbles u into u tilde is completely classical. Okay, so we can kind of run this under a classical GPC, and this is uh, very helpful because we're going to get some, you know, malicious security out of our, you know, malicious secure classical MPC. So we're going to basically be able to ensure that u tilde is is computed properly. Okay, so. Right, so A gets this garbled input, gets this properly computed U tilde, and from that is able to obtain its output. So this is the basic idea. There's still kind of one uh, big issue that needs to be taken care of. Like this classical TPC is ensuring that, that U tilde is correctly computed, but what about this garbled input? Okay, so you know, in particular, a uh, malicious uh, party B might send a malformed um, garbled input. Um, in particular, they might not be lying about, or they might not send like proper zero and two states. So without going into details, uh, we're going to need to include some extra two message protocols that basically allow A to check for these uh, properly formed zero and two states. Okay. Um, and these, these checks are uh, inspired um, by uh, similar checks that were used in DGJMS in a more interactive setting. Um, and we basically show like two message versions of these, these, these checks, okay? Um, so yeah, this gives, this gives a picture of basically how our uh, quantum NISC protocol is, is constructed. And before moving on, I will mention a, we have a corollary of this, um, is that we can use this to build a, a particular type of a designated verifier, a non-interactive zero knowledge protocol for QMA. Um, and it has interesting properties like reusable uh, uh, malicious security. Um, and like the, you know, the actual statement we get is that like if we combine two message oblivious transfer with um, uh, MDB NISIC for NP, then we get this uh, protocol for QMA, okay? And this is the same, this MDB NISIC for QMA is the same object. It was also constructed by Shmeli, um, also appearing at this crypto conference. Um, you know, one difference uh, kind of the, Advantage of our protocol is that um, uh, the prover in our protocol only requires one copy of the quantum witness state. Okay, whereas in this other uh, protocol um, from Schmelly, there's uh, the prover needed multiple copies. Okay, so that but this is, yeah. So this is just one um, application we have of our of our quantum NISC. Okay. So 
Good. Now um, I'd like to move on and and say, well, we've so far we've just considered protocols where one party obtains an output, right? So what if we want, you know, the more general setting where both parties are obtaining some output? And what if we, you know, for, furthermore, we want to maintain the, the, the optimal round complexity of two, right? So there's a pretty natural classical approach to doing this. So if you have some, you know, classical functionality um, now that has two outputs, you can basically consider writing it as two separate functionalities. One that just outputs like A's part of the output and the other that just outputs B's part of the output. And then you could consider running two NISC protocols in parallel. Okay, so you could have you know, the blue NISC that's delivering A's output and the orange NISC that de is delivering B's output. This is a natural approach and it can be made to work in the classical setting. However, there are some significant barriers uh, to making this work in the quantum setting, okay? And uh, the reason, uh, well, one reason is that this seems to require cloning inputs, right? You need to run these two parallel protocols on the same set of inputs, but if your inputs are quantum, you can't in general clone them. And kind of even worse, uh, um, this like say that this functionality is is randomized. Well, what what you're actually doing when you write it as two functionalities is is kind of fixing a particular random string, R, and then using that same random string in both of these like F A and F B, right? Because if you didn't do this, then these outputs Y A Y B wouldn't be properly jointly distributed. Okay. So this relies on the fact that you can really take a, a, pro, a, a randomized protocol and make it deterministic by fixing the random string. And this is something also that you just cannot do in the quantum setting, right? Because maybe randomness um, is coming from measurement, okay? And so this, this issue, the fact that you can't kind of like fix the randomness and split up a protocol like this um, is, you know, it even comes up even if these, even if these uh, inputs, XA and XB are classical but maybe the parties want to compute a quantum functionality over them, okay? So these are kind of, you know, no cloning and not being able to fix the randomness are two, two issues that kind of prevent this natural approach from, uh, from working, okay? So this is just to highlight um, maybe some difficulties in getting a two round protocol. Um, and now I'll basically, I won't be able to go into details about like um, our technical contributions here, but I'll be able to give result statements. So basically, the first thing we do is we relax the problem a little bit and we we construct a two round protocol where pre processing is allowed, meaning that the parties can exchange some um, you know, messages beforehand before they before they obtain their inputs. Okay, and then once they obtain their inputs, it's just a two round protocol. And so we construct this object um, from sub exponentially secure LWE. Okay, so two round uh, two party. Uh, quantum computation with free processing. Of course, we uh, are, are also interested in, you know, what's actually happening um, in, in uh, the setting without pre-processing, like, like, can we actually obtain a truly two round protocol, right? And we, and here it's still like pretty open, okay? Um, we only have like a partial negative result and a partial positive result, okay? So um, our partial negative result is really uh, in an attempt to formalize this intuition I was, I was mentioning before about what makes this problem difficult. And this formalization is, uh, takes the form of saying, well, there is a particular like class of uh, simulators, right? Um, that is impossible in the sense that you can't construct a two round protocol with what we call an oblivious simulator. And an oblivious simulator is basically one that um, kind of programs the CRS independently of, of which of the two parties is, is corrupted. And this is uh, kind of interesting, and, or I should say, well, we only obtain this uh, results under a, a, a an information theoretic conjecture, okay? Um, but this is interesting because this type of oblivious simulation is, uh, um, uh, does suffice for classical two-round uh, TPC. Okay. So it kind of shows under this conjecture, a separation between the classical and quantum cases. Um, but we have a partial positive result as well that says that, well, if you, um, you know, assume access to a quantum oracle, in other words, like basically assuming like ideal obfuscation of a uh, particular quantum functionality, then you can construct a two round two party computation protocol and this necessarily uses non oblivious uh, simulation. 
Um, but I, I call it, uh, I'd say this is a proof of concept because we don't even know any um, heuristic approaches to constructing, um, you know, uh, obfuscation of quantum circuits, right? So um, this is kind of, at this point, it's not even a heuristic construction, it's just a proof of concept saying how, you know, maybe suggesting how one might uh, construct such a protocol. Okay, so again, yeah, we have these partial positive and, and negative results, but um, this question is, is remaining open. So I think that's all I wanted to say about the two party case. I can quickly say um, uh, something about uh, what we do in the multi party case. And really, I'm just going to be uh, focusing on one particular issue that comes up in the multi party case. Okay which is that now we have to be worried about the number of rounds. Like it, in the end, we want a constant round protocol, right? So we, we do not want this number of rounds to depend on the number of parties partaking in the protocol, right? And to see why this might be difficult, um, generally in MPC, you know, you have to have, each party is going to first um, commit to some input that's going to be used in the computation, okay? And the classical setting, you know, Every party can like, you know, classically commit to their classical input and then broadcast their commitment to all other parties, right? In a single round. Um, but broadcasting quantum information is not possible, again, due to, due to no cloning, okay? So let's look at basically how prior work, so DGJMS, uh, how this, this uh, work approaches this input commit, commitment phase. So here you have, you know, you have your quantum parties and say you want your first party to commit to their input X1. What's going to happen is each of the parties uh, chooses their own uniform randomness in the form of a Clifford. And uh, party one is going to send a Clifford encoding to party two of their input. And then party two is going to kind of re-randomize this with their own Clifford. And this is going to continue all the way around the circle of parties. And at the end, what we end up with is like party one holds this encoded quantum state, but the parties all share the encoding key. Okay, so Groning key is kind of secret shared among all the parties. And this is uh, a good enough commitment to allow uh, MPC. So the issue with this is that like the number of rounds like really grows with the number of parties, right? You're sending this quantum state around in, around in a circle. So our approach to, to round collapse uh, this um, step is to use teleportation, okay? So in the first round, we'll have parties like set up EPR, EPR pairs with each other. And then what we're going to do is have the parties, you know, teleport and apply their random Cliffords like simultaneously, like in a single round, right? And this basically leads to the same result as before, except that there are teleportation errors now inserted between all of these Cliffords. Um, but this is okay because we can then use classical MPC again in like a, a round efficient way to correct these teleportation errors. So this whole in input commitment phase can be done in a constant number of rounds. Okay, and so this is kind of the one issue I wanted to highlight. And I, you know, in the paper, we you know, leverage this and combine with other techniques to eventually arrive at a full-fledged constant round uh, multi-party quantum computation protocol. In particular, assuming two message OT, we get a five round MPQC protocol. And then we also have the same, you know, same sort of result as in the two-party case. We can do um, even just two rounds um, as long as we allow some input-independent pre-processing. And this result uh, again follows from sub-exponentially secure LWE. So this is uh, our result statements in the multi-party setting. Um, so now, yeah, I just wanted to quickly recap. So basically, you know, what this work is is an initiation of the study of round efficiency in multi-party quantum computation. And um, there is another, you know, there's a concurrent work also um, um, appearing at uh, this crypto conference that also um, uh, studies round efficiency. Okay. Um, and I wanted to also remind uh, you of like, uh, there's basically a, a, a few interesting challenges uh, that are that arise that are specific to the quantum setting uh, when you want to, you know, attempt to um, kind of come up with round efficient protocols, um, you know. Things like functionalities cannot be made deterministic, which is quite useful in the classical setting. Inputs can't be cloned. Uh, inf quantum information can't be broadcast. And so like these are useful things in the classical setting and we need different uh, uh, techniques um, um, in the quantum setting uh, to obtain kind of similar results, right? Um, 
And then finally, uh, this open question that I think is pretty interesting is like, does, does two rounder like round optimal secure computation exist, right? We have these, these two kind of partial results um, and like kind of this uh, partial negative result that I hope is kind of just uh, eventually going to point to um, uh, basically uh, new methods for obtaining eventually a positive result. But this question is, is, is remaining open. So um, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. So, so thank you for listening.